Hirsch, uh, to discuss politics of nature conservation in Southeast Asia. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Robert. Um, and thank you very much to uh, the organizers for inviting me this, to Philip de Scholar, uh, for uh, re a really fabulous encapsulation of your uh, complex book this, uh, this morning. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. I think what I have to say this afternoon will be in a slightly different sort of uh, mode and tenor. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a geographer with some anthropological training, but uh, a, a geographer first and foremost. Um, and so the, uh, the categories and the ways I talk about politics of conservation uh, may or may not uh, uh, articulate with what, uh, what we talked about uh, this morning. But I think we finished on a very interesting note before the, discuss the discussion talking about politics and, and power and what sort of categories are and, uh, and aren't uh, useful. I guess my main message in this presentation, which isn't a very novel message, but which I'd like to illustrate in some cases, um, is that there's a politics, not just to culture, not just to nature, but also a politics to the separation of culture and uh, nature in uh, Southeast Asia. Increasingly also, uh, there's a politics to their juxtaposition, to the ways in which they come together, or, as I'll explain a bit uh, later, to what we might call their re-juxtaposition, having been separated the ways in which uh, various uh, projects, various discourses, various policies, various debates uh, consider uh, the extent uh, to which uh, culture and nature uh, are one or are, uh, are separate. Um, so if we look at um, uh, whoops. there we go. Um, uh, uh, if we look at uh, uh, a quote from somebody I'll talk whose work I'll talk about a bit late, uh, later on, uh, we can suggest that in some ways all nature conservation and environmental uh, efforts are projects in, uh, in politics. We can exemplify that I think with uh, most sort of uh, visually and, and, and geographically uh, there we go uh, and, 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 and geographically in Southeast Asia as in many parts of the world in the, the politics of separation uh, between the natural and the human spheres uh, that comes with the declaration of protected areas where zones are declared natural and everything out, outside those are supposed to be uh, for, uh, for human uh, use. Uh, so the separation of the natural and the human are most obviously and geographically enacted uh, through uh, these zones that are in principle off limits to human activity uh, based on the idea that human activity somehow under undermines the, uh, uh, the natural. Um, we can see that it, in Southeast Asia uh, as, uh, uh, as much or more than anywhere else in the world very significant areas of territory have been declared natural and therefore uh, not appropriate for uh, human use, human residence uh, of course, they are for, for governance, for, uh, for management, but, but, but not for the people who live there. But as many studies have shown, and I don't think Gao has been uh, prominent among these, uh, and as many actions by people uh, affected by this sort of protected area policies demonstrate, there's many problems uh, and issues with this, uh, with this policy, uh, problems that have been politicized. Uh, one is the very notion uh, that these areas deemed natural areas of Southeast Asia represent a so somehow untouched wilderness uh, is, is problem problematic and, uh, and uh, most studies uh, of course show that they've been created, they've been shaped by human activity over centuries, over uh, millennia. So the whole idea that there are places uh, that are wilderness that are untouched uh, in itself is, is, is problematic. Um, Another, and uh, the one that uh, manifests itself most immediately in the political uh, sense uh, through various uh, conflicts, uh, is 
that so many of the protected areas are declared in, in places where people have be, been living for a long time, much, uh, and, uh, and the, the boundaries uh, are drawn irrespective of, uh, of settlement. And so immediately uh, people living inside those areas uh, become uh, uh, illegal. Uh, the people have been living using uh, resources for farming, for, uh, for collection of forest products, for fishing, and, um, and, and so on, the kinds, of, the kinds of things that Ajahn Chayan was, uh, was talking about uh, uh, this morning in the very close interaction, for example, of people between, uh, but, uh, of the, between the people and, and the river that they uh, live along in northeastern Thailand. Uh, a third key element in the politics of protected areas is the uh, very questionable assumption that states look after forests better than uh, the people who live closer to them, who depend on them most immediately, and who know them much more intimately than do park rangers, uh, uh, managers, and, uh, and, and, and other officials. So in some ways, this is a sort of easy, easy one to look at in, in looking at and critiquing the way in which uh, nature and, uh, and culture uh, uh, have been separated in, in Southeast Asia through, I guess, what you'd call the, the naturalist uh, uh, tradition writ, writ large. Um, there we go. Um, if we look at these, um, these dichotomies or, or relations between our culture and nature, human and uh, non-human realms, uh, society and environment. Of course, we can see that uh, in many ways we're talking about fairly uh, similar things, but not exactly the, uh, the same thing. There's many other dimensions and protected areas and many other contexts in the politics of separating culture uh, from, from nature, which we can discuss as culture nature. But I'm going to make, make the task of discussing uh, the politics of the human and non-human uh, dialectic a bit easier uh, by expanding it to consider, uh, consider it in terms of what I call society environment rather than nature uh, culture interactions. I noticed that in the uh, description of the agenda for the meeting, you actually use the same the same terms, uh, uh, society and environment. And I don't think uh, it, I, I, I don't want to spend time talking about it now, but it might be a talking point uh, later on uh, to, to consider what the distinctions are between talking about culture, society, uh, nature, uh, nature, environment, and, and what what these categories mean at uh, at different levels. Uh, there we go. Uh, we can see if we look at the main languages of the uh, of the region. Uh, we already heard from Ajahn the um, particular meaning uh, of nature in, in Thai, Tamachat. Um, in, in in Thai, the uh, term for environment is is sing which basically means the things the things that surround us. Uh, whereas Tamachat has got a, I guess, a more sort of substantive uh, sense of connection, as you say, with. Uh, uh, with, uh, with Buddhism, with life, uh, and so on. In, in, in uh, Khmer, uh, Baristan, uh, and, and Tomachiat, uh, in Laos, in Vietnam, and, 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 uh, and, and Tamasat. So there's, uh, we, we can see in each language there's a clear distinction, as there is in English, between uh, society uh, and environment. And yet, the, they're, both, they're obviously related, but they're perhaps uh, a little bit too conflated in the way we uh, in the way we talk about things, and, and this partly has to do with uh, with scale, where we think about society and environment in the in the bigger picture, which we often associate with uh, politics. But it's not it's not just about uh, it's not just about uh, scale. Um, environment's very closely tied to uh, the um, uh, ideas of a nature on which we uh, all depend for our well-being. Uh, and also a nature that's been become hostage to our own actions. So mo mo our use of the environment is often uh, about the implicit uh, or impending or actual uh, destruction of this, this thing we call, uh, we call the natural. Um, there's there's many, uh, many ways in which this is framed in, in Southeast Asia, but I think one of the more interesting ones, and, and, and in fact it's a field that in many ways has come out of uh, uh, Southeast Asia uh, as a context is, is a field of uh, political ecology, which is 
Uh, it's a very nebulous uh, field, but it's one uh, that's often understood to be based on the notion uh, that environment is embedded in the social, uh, in the economic, and in, uh, in political nation, uh, relations, as well, of course, as in, as in, uh, as in culture. Uh, environment's understood as both a, a materialized but also an idealized uh, medium uh, through which we increasingly interact with each other as individuals, communities, societies, uh, nations, and even in, in, in international relations, so at many spatial scales and at many, uh, many uh, temporal scales. But I think less well considered is um, the other, if you like, the other direction of determination. We often understand, uh, for those of us who work in political ecology, uh, that environment is not just explicable by, by the natural, by the scientific, by the human processes that we learn in the natural sciences, and again, interesting term, natural, uh, natural sciences, uh, but we, we turn towards the social sciences for explanation and determination of why things are happening to the environment or to nature in, in, the, way we, in the way they are. So we tend to uh, see environment to some extent as a product of uh, society, economy, uh, politics, and, uh, and of course culture, but, uh, but less well considered and, and something which I've uh, tried to write about uh, over uh, uh, time from time to time, is uh, the way the env the environment as a as a field as a, uh, as a as a realm is itself constitutive of society, economy, uh, and and politics uh, in in the sense that it increasingly uh, is a, a point of reference for uh, interactions uh, between uh, people between communities within communities uh, at the societal level uh, and. Uh, and so on. So we, we can see uh, environment as embedded in society, economy, and politics and culture. Um, but we can uh, also uh, look at the mutual determination, determination or the interdetermination uh, between uh, between the two. Uh, now, if we look at environment as constitutive of, of society, economy, and politics, we have to be careful. There's a, there's a, a long and old tradition of environmental determinism. We, we don't want to go down, uh, down that track. Uh, but I think that there are uh, more interesting ways in which we can uh, look at this re reflexivity as a key idea and organizing framework uh, in, in the way we look at uh, environment as embedded in society. That, um, uh, a few of us uh, brought out this handbook of environment in Southeast Asia. I don't think Gal uh, wrote a, a wonderful chapter on, uh, on uh, looking at the linkage or lack of linkage between the feminist and the environmentalist uh, movement in, uh, in Thailand. And the, the basic organizing uh, framework of, uh, of the book is to look at this embeddedness, to look at uh, in, in environment as, among other things, a, a window onto uh, Society, culture, and, uh, and and politics in uh, southeast uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, in I don't think Gao's uh, case, one of the uh, key concepts that emerges is uh, environment, in environment, uh, and nature as a class-ridden uh, category, and the importance of uh, of class in <coughs> in shaping the ways in which. Uh, superficially similar, but in fact uh, materially. Uh, very different uh, uh, projects or in environmental uh, cases are shaped. In in in, in Pink Gao's uh, case, uh, she looks at two dams: one dam, the Nam Jon Dam, which was a kind of uh, it was a, a key point in the rise of the environmental movement in uh, in Thailand. But ultimately, it was about a dam uh, that was perceived by mainly urban, mainly middle class, and the international community as uh, destructive of a, a pristine nature in the, in, in the west of Thailand, with very, re very little reference to, uh, to people's uh, livelihoods. And she rep represents this as a kind of uh, masculinity of, uh, uh, and, 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 and one that's, that's very urban-based. And she contrasts this with the case that Jan Chayan talked about this morning, the Bak Muon Dam in northeastern Thailand, uh, which was all, all about... Uh, uh, had very little to do with trees, very little to do with landscapes that uh, are commonly associated by urbanites as, as, as nice, pristine, gray, green uh, landscapes, but it had every, everything to do uh, with livelihoods and intimate relations between uh, people, uh, it, people, their river, uh, and, and their 
uh, their livelihoods and, and belief systems. And I don't think our representatives deserve as a, as a, as a uh, more uh, feminine uh, type of uh, uh, manifestation of uh, environmentalism. So we can see gender and, and, and class here. Um, another, another case uh, in, in uh, the book is, is Rob, uh, Robert Cram's uh, chapter on shifting cultivation, one of the really persistent points of uh, focus for different understandings of how we see the relationship between culture and nature, and also the, one of the most uh, politicized, that with a, a, you could say with a sort of small p politics uh, idea of politicized, one of the most politicized and persistent uh, issues in Southeast Asia, as in many other parts of the world, but maybe particularly in, uh, in, in Southeast Asia, in the way uh, the representations of the relationship between uh, people and uh, forests uh, matter. Uh, uh, an excellent uh, exposition of this is in Tim, Tim Forsyth and uh, Andrew Walker's book, Forest Guardians, uh, uh, Forest Destroyers. Uh, where they talk, I mean, they talk about the substance of, uh, of shifting cultivation and uh, what happens in the hills of northern Thailand and whether or not people are actually destroying the forest. But the main, but the main point was to show how uh, the, uh, the politics of representation uh, has, uh, has become fundamental to, uh, to the, uh, the debate. Um, and, 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 there, and there are many other uh, examples in the book of the ways in which um, we can see the embeddedness of environment in, in society, culture, and uh, economy, and, uh, uh, and, and politics. Another way of looking at the constitutive role of environment in the uh, politics, particularly the oppositional politics of a region marked so much now as more than ever before by authoritarian rule, is to look at the way in which environment has created spaces uh, for alternative challenges. Some of those challenges um, some of those challenges um, are directly related to the environment, but they go well beyond uh, ideas of, uh, of, of nature. Uh, so in Thailand, for example, if we look at the rise of the uh, NGO movement, the civil society movement, uh, through the environment of movement in the 1980s, uh, this was a period of post uh, leftist opposition at a time when uh, much opposition, if it got at the real issues of, uh, of land and, uh, and, uh, and, and power, uh, was still extremely sensitive. But the environment uh, created uh, the space, the, uh, the window, as a relatively inclusive, relatively safe political space, and yet one which, of course, was also, also had a politics of its own, depending on whether it was, uh, it was urban uh, environmentalists or, uh, or those who were uh, working from first and foremost from a, an everyday livelihoods uh, uh, perspective. Um, so we can, uh, we can see uh, also the, the evolution of uh, this idea of, a, of uh, an environmental movement as giving a, a legitimizing voice or a legitimized voice to uh, the discourse of uh, op opposition, which works up to a point as an inclusive voice, but also then uh, very uh, quickly and very uh, easily uh, becomes uh, divided as the underlying uh, schisms of class, gender, ethnicity, urban, rural, uh, elite, subaltern, uh, divide themselves. And there's various ways in which this has manifested itself over time in, in, in Thailand. One uh, is through what's sometimes termed, I think, a little bit too simpl simplistically, but it's sometimes termed the, uh, termed the sort of green versus the red uh, approach to uh, in, uh, environmentalism. It reminds me of uh, Michael Redcliffe's very, I think, very prescient book of the early 1980s on uh, uh, red or green alternatives uh, to look at the extent to which the environmental uh, movement was another uh, uh, articulation uh, of, uh, of, of what were fundament, fundamentally, fundamentally class-based uh, issues. In other countries in the region, which other, others, others in the room will know uh, better than, uh, than I will, I think we can, we can also see ways in which environment has created something of a, a relatively safe space for challenge to modernist thinking. Even in Vietnam, uh, the resonance back to Ho Chi Minh uh, and his, was in, a, in the early uh, 1960s gave a space to uh, to those in the immediate uh, uh, emergence of the market economy and the rel relative 
uh, openness of the uh, early 1990s to, to bring environment as a space to which challenges to some of the uh, large modernist uh, statist uh, projects of dams and uh, eucalyptus plantations and so on uh, were being, were being uh, rolled out. In Cambodia, I think we can, we can see uh, environment as a, as a uh, way into uh, getting at very sensitive and important human rights issues. And of course, it's very, very difficult, as the, as the comment uh, earlier on uh, this morning uh, made it clear, it's very difficult to separate environment, natural resource, and human rights issues because we're talking about fundamental right to livelihood and, uh, and, 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 and life itself. In Laos, uh, where there's a much uh, quieter or some would say even non-existent uh, discourse of opposition, even there, I've seen on university campus, the ways in which nature clubs have been developed by some of the more uh, uh, interesting and inter interested uh, students as one of the very few spaces uh, for student organization on campus uh, to try, try to mobilize interest in, in public interest uh, uh, issues. So we can see in, in, in environment as, as this uh, space for, uh, uh, for opposition. And then at another level, we can also see the way in, in which environment has become central to certain key international political questions at the regional level, whether it's the Mekong, as Ajahn uh, Chayan talked about this morning, the question of smoke haze between Indonesia, Singapore, and Malaysia, and even southern Thailand, or the management of the South China Sea, East Sea, we can see uh, in, 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 as, a, as, a, as a space uh, uh, that uh, helps to shape the uh, politics and also open up a, um, a, a stage for uh, uh, for the expression of those, of those politics. And then a final consideration I'd like to just bring in uh, in the embedding of uh, nature or environment in, in social relations is the role of what we call the market. Um, there's, uh, I mean, there hasn't been really any discussion, I think, so far uh, this morning about uh, the market, and yet the market is so important as a, as a category now in the way in which people think about everything but in, in, in environment in itself and over the past couple of decades uh, the market and market logics have become an important part of what is sometimes called neoliberalized nature the way in which uh, uh, everything becomes sucked in and incorporated into these uh, into these logics um, including sometimes seemingly progressive agendas such as the idea of payment for environmental services compensation for foregone livelihoods for people people who otherwise would have been just expected to move out of their uh, or stop practicing their agriculture in, in the areas they live in. But in fact, the interplay between markets and nature is, of course, not really new at all in, uh, in Southeast Asia or, or elsewhere. I referred at the beginning to uh, Charles Zerner work, Zerner's work. He, he uh, put together, a, a, I think, a really wonderful book on, um, oh, I'm sorry, on uh, uh, on uh, people, plants, and uh, justice, and, and subtitled The Politics of Nature Conservation in, uh, in Southeast Asia. And he uses a very, a very interesting example, well, he uses the, the example of the uh, naturalist uh, scientist uh, uh, Alfred Russell uh, Wallace, who marveled not just at the natural phenomena of eastern Indonesia, of uh, Aru and the other islands there, uh, but just as much uh, at the integral way in which uh, local cultures interacted uh, with these productions of, of nature through markets as much as anything else. But of course, the markets he was talking about were not the disarticulated neoliberal idea of the market. These are uh, markets that are embedded themselves in social and ritual relations uh, rather than this uh, disarticulated, disembedded neoliberal notion of the market uh, as a kind of totalizing abstraction as the lowest common denominator of uh, value. He then skips us forward a, a century and shows how completely uh, markets under uh, the current statist and neoliberal uh, governance uh, have become the antithesis to, uh, to nature. Markets are seen as a threat uh, that requires conservation to separate the seemingly bottomless pit of human demand that the market represents uh, from the natural and hence the need for uh, protected uh, areas. Um, we, see, we see this really uppermost in the uh, 
arguments and demands by so-called deep green urban-based conservationists against human settlement in or near protected areas. This has been part of a long-standing uh, uh, conflict and, and, and debate over the uh, never realized community forest bill in Thailand, uh, for example. Tanya Lee talks about the so-called indigenous slot uh, into which uh, indigenous uh, people or tribes, uh, uh, groups with cultures different from the minority are put in. And Andrew Walker uh, critiques uh, what he's called the Karen consensus uh, as, as various governmentalities uh, put conditionalities on the way people are expected to behave in their, uh, in their uh, traditional grounds and ultimately, as Andrew Walker uh, puts it, are painted into, uh, into corners uh, that, uh, that define them as non-market subjects uh, who uh, are, uh, are often on the one hand celebrated and on the other have their livelihoods completely circumscribed. Uh, as a result of uh, the, the assumptions on the way in which they live with nature differently from, uh, from the rest of the uh, citizens of the country in which they find, uh, find themselves. And then finally, uh, Charles Zerner writes about um, a third way of uh, approaching this nature culture or society environment uh, juxtaposition in uh, Aru in Indonesia, more widely in Southeast Asia and of course around the world, through the so-called CBNRM, Community-Based Natural Resource Management Projects, uh, where uh, on the one hand we, uh, we see a type of project that's in principle based on a revitalization of locally and culturally based accommodations between livelihoods and development, uh, but also ones that have a great deal of invention of tradition and, and the sort of not just reinstitutionalization, but the, a, a new type of institutionalization and self-circumscribing of, uh, of, uh, of resource uh, use. And there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a good literature, a critical literature, uh, that doesn't, it doesn't throw out the baby with the bathwater, it doesn't, doesn't uh, critique the notion of CBNRM, but the, but the questions, uh, many of the premises uh, that it's based on in terms of its uh, sort of deeper understanding of, 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 of culture and uh, its relationship with nature. Um, so, in, so in summary, that uh, the environmental politics in, in Southeast Asia re revolve around some uh, key debates. Uh, they can be articulated simply as questions, can and should people live in protected areas? Should we, should we think about uh, nature and culture as, as, as separately uh, zoned. Our market-based approach is uh, the solution for achieving equity and sustainability. And if so, what do we really mean by market? What sort of markets are we talking about? Is decentralized governance the means towards a more effective and equitable conservation? And if so, uh, with what, what reference to, uh, to culture? So if we, if we extrapolate nature, uh, culture to the sort of broader environment, society uh, uh, framing, we, we do indeed find inextricable intertwining of the domains, uh, but with uh, many uh, important and interesting investigations waiting to be, to be done. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Philip. Um, I'd like to now invite Jean Tinkiao to talk about science and sanctity, the articulation of modern and vernacular forestry in Thailand. Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, very stimulating uh, seminar. I'm an anthropologist, and uh, my, actually my PhD work focuses on the politics of uh, modern science uh, scientific forestry and local knowledge. Um, so, but I'm more interested in how, um, you know, science or to use the scholar term, this nationalism lands, you know, in a certain context, uh, in the animist land of Thailand. So um, this afternoon I'll be using uh, the case study of scientific forestry and how it interacts with vernacular ideas. Uh, in Thailand as uh, a case study. So in pre-modern Siam, uh, the term pa or forest was not necessarily the same entity as nature. 
a Danish anthropologist working among the poor Karen in the western part of Thailand. Uh, Anders Jorgensen argued that uh, although prakriti, the term, uh, the Hindu term, often translated as nature, the primary material energy of which all matter is composed, is a really old concept in Hindu and Buddhist uh, Asia. Villages of South and Southeast Asia have no specific expressions embracing such concept. Philip Stop, uh, Philip Stott, sorry, a British geographer, also noted that the term Tamashat, the Thai term for nature, is a word too refined and wide in its meaning and was not part of the elite notion of natural su surrounding until recently. The Thai concept of Tamashat embraces all phenomena which are not organized or constructed by human beings, such as rain, wind, sun, or even natural human behavior. At the same time, the term for forest, such as pa and thuan, mean more than simply forest or wood. For the Siamese elite, this entity connotes the state of being inherently wide, untamed, unsocialized, uncivilized space and beings, standing in direct contrast with and outside the realm of Mueang, which is the principality, the space of inherently civilized and cultivated and organized existence. Both Mueang and Pa, both Mueang elite and Pa uh, dwellers share a similar animistic ontology towards forest. Although the perception of Pa from forest dwellers might be a bit different from those who are in the center. For example, among the poor Karen in Western uh, Thailand, although the realm of the wild consists of all kinds of beings, including plants, animals, ghosts, and various other spiritual, including human beings, all of these actors are subject to and follow certain uh, cellophane uh, rules. So the model that distinguished different attributes of the beings in the pre-modern Siam was therefore not the ontological divide of nature and culture, but the hi hierarchical power relation between Pa and Mueang, the wide and the civilized, or the hill and valley, to use uh, Scott's term, with the latter as the center of the kingdom, and was recognized as possessing greater spiritual energy that could be harnessed under the right control of power. Within this model, Forest monasteries and forest monks or Aranyawasi both mediate and transcend this dichotomy and have historically been used by the kings to bring the religion to bear in the wild or the Parthian. This special uh, organization of Pa and Mueang is exemplified in the Buddhist cosmology of three planes of existence, where the Himmawanta or Himmapan the mythical forest is located between the heaven and the earth, with Mount Sumeru representing the center of the universe, where Narayana or Panarai, as we know in Thai, Narayana God resides and was reborn as a king to rule the earth. The Himapan is home to many different kinds of mixed animal creatures, surrounded by a river and seven lakes, and dwelled by sages of the Dharma who eat only fish and animals that die naturally. This model of Hindu-Buddhist cosmology is, however, not shared by uh, forest dwellers. Uh, the question in my work is how has the, the encounter between the Siamese elite and scientific forestry at the end of the 19th century affected the Pai and Mueang relation and the elite's perception towards forest and its existence? Scientific forestry, like other Western science, uh, arrived in Siam in the 19th century and was adopted by the Thai ruler as part of the desire to do mod modernize the kingdom and in response to the necessity to capitalize the kingdom's resources. Modern forestry, while helped bringing the realm of Pa, a forest, into service of the Mueang, have transformed the wide entity of Pa Thuyen into a calculable timber forest, or Pa Mai. This has been made possible by setting aside the mythical aspect of the Pa in order to allow the mechanic function of science to reap the most benefit out of the forest. 
but such adoption of science has been, however, selective. But Hajataji, an Indian historian, argued that in India, colonial and local uh, encounter had been rather complex, which resulted in the spiritual and material dichotomy that laid the framework for the selective appropriation and rejection of Western influences. Tongchai Vinichakun, a Thai historian on a similar vein, posited that while the Siamese elite recognized the strength of the physical sciences and the material or outer world of the West, the strength of vernacular science lies in the spiritual, the inner self that informs constructions of identity. This has resulted in what Tong Chai called the spiritual and material bifurcation as an intellectual frame that aid the Thai Western negotiation and and epistemological measures for self-preservation and self-protection. So in the realm of forestry, I would argue, ontological bifurcation as a result of the articulation of scientific and vernacular forestry works in two directions. On the one hand, camera and conservation sciences of forestry have reorganized the physicality of the forest, reclassified trees and animals, created the hierarchy of values through the making of boundaries, species, and lifespans of non-human beings, and redefined the worldly relationship between human and forest. On the other hand, the animistic aspect of forest has not been replaced by scientific forestry, but has been sanctified and ritualized. Among the elite of the Mueang, the dual processes of mythicalization as well as rationalization of trees, animals, and forests are significant means of control over Pa and the universe. For forest dwellers, local bifurcation of animism and science has resulted in the rationalization of forest rituals, and in some cases, the invention of new Buddhist rituals that can be translated into ecological perception. Such bifurcation has served as means of negotiation in an unequal relation between the Pa and the Mueang. For the elite in the Mueang, the process of bifurcation reflects the ability to make exception, to induce appropriation, and to selectively collaborate among different kinds of ontology. It is the bifurcation of science and sanctity that has empowered the Mueang to continue its control over the realm of Pa in contemporary Thai society. So I would briefly uh, introduce this history of the modern, science, uh, modern forestry uh, in Thailand with the quotes from first is the first uh, forest uh, director of uh, for, uh, Royal Forest uh, Department of Thailand, uh, Herbert Slade. Um, forests in Thailand entered the realm of science at the end of 19th century with the expansion of the British Locking Company into the northern region after teak forests in British Burma has declined. This peels over overlapping concessions, the threats by British uh, colonials to intrude in the northern ter territory, and the increasing lucrative value of teak had prompted the Bangkok government to initiate a systematic control of the forest. The Royal Forestry Department, or RFD, was established in 1896 under a suggestion by Herbert Slade, um, who is former deputy conservator of forests in Burma, who served as the first director of the department. Between 1896 to 1923, RFD had been headed and staffed by all British, with a few Thai officials. The modernization of Pa to the scientific forestry has brought a new perception to the once neglected peripheral area, with the German model of the scientific forestry, followed by the British foresters. The formerly wide and mystic realm had now been become visible, calculable, and brought into the realm of Mueang as the country's capital. The term Pa forest was replaced by Pa Mai, which means forest wood or timber forest, uh, timber resources. The utilitarian discourse in which the focus is on those aspects of forest that can be appropriated for commercial use. As Scott uh, argued, the fiscal forestry, the actual trees, was replaced by an abstract tree representing a volume of lumber or firewood. Through forestry science, a subdiscipline of cameral science, forest is divided into roughly equal plots with the number 
of plots coinciding with the number of years in the assumed growth cycle. One plot was cut each year on the assumption of equal yields and value from plots of equal size. In the case of Thailand, forest areas were divided into two portions to be harvested over 15 years, one open and one closed, thereby making a 30-year felling cycle. Notion of forest revolved around teak as the valuable and desirable species of timber trees. Quote unquote, this other forest was then simplified or categorized into three elements based on distinctive economic values, teak and non-teak, which in Thai they call Maikaya Rui, which, you know, it doesn't exist. It's an abstract term to refer to anything uh, but teak. And non-timber products. Why the undesirables were defined as tree weeds and runs, which were to be eliminated. Mapping, enumerating, and demarcating were carried out to serve the goal of sustainable harvesting of value tim timber. The era of Pa Mai Sak or teak forest ended after the World War II as the concession period was over and most of the teak tree vanished. Although lock, um, however, the locking of non-teak trees defined as Mai Kayale continued throughout the country. Although locking was banned in 1989, the mono species model of commercial forestry persists, moving from in situ tree extraction to ex situ tree harvesting, in which teak remains dominant among uh, other fast growing species. So it's just a picture of how they transport, transport timber, teak logs back in the old time. In mid 20th century, conservation science of um, Conservation science of forestry was adopted by the Thai elite with the establishment of national parks and wildlife sanctuaries, while the Cameroon science of forestry transformed forests into a chessboard of timber resources. <coughs> the American concept of protected areas introduced the idea of pristine nature, that Jan uh, Philip Hirsch already talked about, outside the history of human context, an independent domain of intrinsic value, truth, and authenticity that need to be preserved. Similar to the model of the productive forest where teak is highlighted as precious tree, conservation forests set apart certain kinds of forest and ecosystem, assigning superior aesthetic value over the other for protection. So Thailand, uh, 128 national parks and 57 wildlife sanctuaries comprise mostly large mountainous forests, beaches, and islands, which are valued highly for tourism and the conservation of large mammals. The American model of monumentalism and giganticism have become fundamental to the new notion of wilderness in Thailand. Both productive and conservation forests are the product of the capitalist nature, where forests have been turned into a commodity of exchange value. And through the development of science and machine, forests deprived of their agency have been assigned a passive role under a totalizing perspective, waiting to be consumed materially or aesthetically. Capitalist nature has been, then been the hegemonic regime of the Thai modern society. This is a picture of um, the young forester who was sent to, I think there are two places where they send the, the, the Thai or forestry students to. One is in India, another one is in Burma, uh, in Manor. Um, so now I turn to uh, another subject, what I call official animism, animism. For more than a century, Western science has continued to dominate intellectual thinking among foresters and technocrats towards trees and forests and the way human beings relate to natural surroundings in Thailand. Nature exists only through its physical, utilitarian, and aesthetic quality separate from and to serve the need of human beings. Yet, such modern thinking did not necessarily contradict with the pre-existing animism towards trees and forests among the elites. While trees are commodified, trees, continue to, trees also continue to be treated as sacred. Since the establishment of IFD, hundreds of forestry textbooks have been written by Thai forest academics to uncover the truth of the scientific subjects of forest ecology and economics. But Thai foresters were also interested in writing about trees in Buddhist cosmology. A former IFD director general published a series of books entitled 
heaven and earth as destined by astrology การดลบันดาลของฟ้าดินตามดวง which is totally not a science subject and among the Thai technocrats the belief that large trees possess souls of one similar to human beings remain intact and this is an, an, uh, one of various examples so to uh, sacrifice their lives for human use a proper worshipping rituals must, must be performed so in removing the sacred trees uh, in the picture on the left hand side I believe is the golden teak and golden shower trees for the construction of the city pillar shrine in Narathiwad province a Hindu Buddhist ritual was held in order to ask for the permission from the trees holy water was sprinkled around the trees while yellow flowers were placed in front of the trees symbolizing soul comforting for the sacrifice during the sacred observance it was reported that the sun was encircled by a halo signifying the auspice and success of the ritual a dead tree is also perceived to be alive and having spirit so this is a Hopi tree uh, it was found in the Wang River uh, and believed to be 150 years old and was cut down during the logging era in Lampang province it was drowned in Wang River for 30 years and was rescued by a dredged uh, vessel so in 2010 the RFD organized a ritual to invite this Hopi tree to reside in the RFD office and the picture you see here is the uh, Director General of AFD performing the ritual himself. One of the most interesting official animism can be exemplified in the royal cremation ceremony just past a few weeks ago, where trees and animals are crucial elements of this rite of passage of the Divine King. Four out of the 19 dead standing sandalwood trees, or my chan home as we know in Thai, inside the Kuiburi National Park, and you know, note that this is a national park. Uh, so they were chosen to make the royal uh, mortuary urn. The tree is fragrant, perceived as auspicious, and has been in use for royal cremation since Ayutthaya era. So in here, a worshipping uh, ceremony to cut the dead standing trees inside the national park was held at an auspicious time with the Buddhist monks and royal Brahmins performing the sacrifice ritual. During the worshipping ceremony again, it was reported that an unusual, an unusual beam of light was shining over the ritual area signifying signifying the spice of the ceremony um, so as the royal cremation ceremony symbolized the right of the passage of the divine king um, symbolized the, the right of, of passage of the uh, divine king and signifying the passing of the earthy avatar of the god Narayana to return to heaven. It was also the time when Hinduism, animism, and science joined hand in hand to send the soul of the king off to the afterlife. On the night of the royal cremation ceremony, a group of white birds was spotted by mourners flying above the royal crematorium pavilion. Um, some said nine, some said uh, twelve. Thirapat Bayun Siddhi, a wildlife expert and former director of IFD, made a remark on this extraordinary incident. And he said, and I quote here, It's unlikely that this group of egrets was out there to catch insects. Egrets are known to find food in wet areas. Some said that the sound of the gun salute might have been frightening them. This is also unlikely, since they were spotted flying over the royal crematorium at 10 p.m when the performance had been over since the evening. Others said that they might be migrating teals. This was also not the case. Teals are usually flying in a bigger group and don't usually pass through a city. As a scientist, I have been trying to find an explanation for this incident. I was discussing this with a friend who was also standing with me at the ceremony, that this was unusual. Egress usually sleep at night time and not active in late night. It was as if they were out to send the king off. We know that the belief of uh, birds as sacred vehicle that lead the soul of human being to an afterlife is uh, not just limited to Thailand, but can be found in many parts of Asia and Southeast Asian uh, societies. And I like to make a remark that throughout the royal cremation ceremony, bifurcation of science and animism prevail. 
even among the scientist community, the middle class, of course, who have often launched criticism against animism held by local people as being superstitious. For them, in this period of time, royal animism is an exception. So my last subject is local bifurcation. Bifurcation has also been practiced among local people other than the elite class in response to changing socioeconomic and political circumstances. The rise of uh, environmentalism and the advent of modernization, especially since 1970s, have brought various pressures into animist cosmology and practices relating to spirit forest. In northern Thailand, the spirit forest has long been part of a domesticated space that is divided from the undomesticated forest by the villagers and also perceived as the inner periphery with malevolent spirits uh, embedding uh, characteristic of disorder and wide wildness. Certain rituals were usually performed, as we, you, we already uh, saw from uh, the morning uh, video session. So um, certain rituals were usually performed to symbolically demarcate the boundary between the village and the forest and to repel any disturbance from forest wildness. The right of forest spirit worshipping was also held as a means to domesticate the evil and white power to become benevolent guardian uh, spirits for the village community. However, the power of modernization and deforestation since the end of the 20th century has had a complex impact impacts on the relationship between the village and the forest. On the one hand, in encountering with the force of modernization, spirit be beliefs have increasingly been weakened and become the symbol of backwardness which are not necessarily upheld by all members of the village communities. On the other hand, the advent of modern um, environmentalism has also given rise to new nature conservation rituals developed by various local actors. For example, tree ordination, a ritual invented by a local monk in Nan province in 1989, which has subsequently been duplicated across the country. So this is not something that used to be uh, practiced in, in Thailand before 1989. Um, the in, or the invention of Sub Chata Menam of or river life prolonging ritual is also another example of reinterpreting the river with modern language. The ceremony is originally held to pray for long life for human beings, houses, villages, or cities. Or another example is the adoption of the term community forest, which is a modern discourse of local management of forests, which come with the modern technology of legibility, such as mapping and demarcation. In this sense, spirit forests have thus been reformulated along the modern lines, shifting local perceptions and modern technology to suit the needs of both the state and the diverse groups and generations of village members. The dynamic of bifurcation between animism and science has not only raised the question of stability of local ontology, but also invite further inquiry into the change and complex relationship between the two modes of existence. Thank you. Okay, so I think um, we have a little bit of time um, take a few questions before the coffee break um, from the audience. So if anyone would like to uh, ask a question, maybe raise, raise your hand and I'll t take a few. Yes, please. I want to ask uh, a question of uh, Pinkyo. Um, just on this last point, it, it struck something that I've been uh, kind of mooling about in, in uh, an ethnographic question. Uh, in Cambodia, we have the officially designated community forest. But I am hearing people say, there's, and, and, and I think that there is a little tension, especially among, uh, among the long-term forest dwellers. Um, and uh, people will talk about the forest that they use, because people that are living up close to the forest, they're not necessarily using the entire forest. They have areas that they say are theirs that they go in for cultivation and they consider it 
their own, right? This is our communities, our communities forest. And I think that I'm seeing, and I want to ask, it's actually one of my research questions for this next little round that I'll be doing in the forest, but I think that there's a little tension there, right? That the, that the state may also have adopted this same vocabulary to map and demarcate and legalize and call these community forests, uh, and that people think of these as their communities forests. Can you, does this um, resonate at all with, with the research that you've done and what you're, um, what you're seeing in China? Well, I guess community forests this course has been adopted by local people and in some cases monks in the village in response to uh, at least two pressures. One is the, you know, the rapid deforestation uh, phenomenon which has been caused by you know, commercial logging company or you know, plant, uh, commercial plantations and things like that. And the state attempt at uh, expanding the areas of conservation forest. So in order to sort of create the ground for communication, because spirit forest, well, in the local term, you know, if they use that kind of language to communicate with the outsiders, we, it will be, first of all, you know, uncommunicable. Second, it's oftentimes being considered a backward type of practice. Right? Sacrificing animals in order to preserve forests, that's not logical. So that's, that's a way of um, trying to, to find a bridge, you know, to communicate with the outsider at the same time um, to negotiate for the right um, to maintain, you know, their natural landscape. But sometimes it has contradiction for sure because the mapping technology has a lot of tension. In the, in the area where um, you know, a clear-cut boundary has never been implemented before. Once you create the map or the, the lines of boundary, you create the, the, the concept of private property. So people start to compete uh, with each other over certain resources. Definitely. I'm asking a little different question, but maybe we'll talk about it later. Okay. I think there's a question over here, please. Um, yeah, so I'm really interested in the separation of nature and culture that we're looking at in this conference, and I'm wondering sort of what people think about or what the speakers uh, think about the work that this separation does. Because I'm thinking specifically of Jason Moore's recent work to come out on uh, world ecologies and how he looked at the sort of violent separation of humanity and nature, not starting with the Industrial Revolution, but with colonialism and the way that this separation was actually backed by imperial power and capitalist rationality, which was used in the creation of sort of unfree, um, unfree labor, as well as to relegate most of humanity, including like humans, ethnic minority groups, indigenous people, as part of nature rather than culture or humanity. So in that sense, I'm wondering um, if the speakers have thought a little bit about, or if anybody else has thought about, what work does this separation do, or what have we seen in our own work? how it relates to the market and other sorts of institutions. Yeah, it's a, of course, it's a huge, a huge question and, uh, and in some ways some fairly sort of obvious uh, answers which I think you've, you've kind of given in, in, in the question about the sort of colonial anti antecedents and the demarcation which we've been uh, talking about, and it comes comes up with the question of mapping technologies, and this sometimes this sort of dilemma about the extent to which those who are trying to maintain uh, uh, access and association and and autonomy and sovereignty over uh, over uh, resources that are that are under threat have this qu question of whether whether they buy into the uh, instruments of power that. Um, uh, that facilitate the leg legibility and therefore the expropriation of the resource, um, or uh, or whether they forego it and, and and therefore then forego any any stake in in uh, or, or claim to continuing management or, or governance of 
of the resource. I mean, it's a fundamental issue. I think it's important to look historically as well and just look at what's what's happened in the last uh, little while. Very, I think a very good example is from is from Laos. I remember when I was working in Laos in the early 1990s, a lot of Thai NGOs who were very frustrated at that time with the uh, deaf ear of the Royal Forestry Department in Thailand to any idea of community management of forestry. got very excited by the uh, Lao government seeming decentralization and wanting to map out these village territories. And they, you know, it, was, it was seen as very, very progressive. There were even some Thai NGOs that worked inside the forestry de uh, department there. But you know, lo, lo and behold, the, uh, uh, what's happened over the intervening 20, 25 years is that in effect these uh, little uh, territories have been the areas that uh, of usually fairly worthless uh, uh, forests that have been uh, uh, that, have, that have cordoned off the rest of the country for ex expropriation, not just for forestry but for plantations and uh, and estates and, uh, and 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 so on. So I think we can see you know we can see a lot of continuities with uh, with the uh, to the uh, to the uh, sort of mod modern separation. But again, it it puts as I think uh, well several speakers today have uh, have said it puts uh, th those who are wondering whether to work with the, if you like, the more vernacular discourses and ideas of the juxtaposition of nature and, 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 and culture to work within or outside the system. One of, for me, one of the very interesting chapters in this book I, I mentioned, the Handbook of Environment in Southeast Asia, is by Lisa Palmer. It's on Timor-Leste. And uh, she looks at, a, at what's, uh, it's a, it's a if you like, a, a sort of vernac vernacular way of, of talking about prohibitions um, that are part of ind indigenous, uh, what we now call resource management systems, but into in interactions with nature called tarabando, and and um, and the way in which it's actually being used instrumentally as quite an effective way to uh, to uh, enact a more decentralised management with what seems to be quite a progressive uh, set of uh, set of programmes. There are there are a number of um, anthropological critiques of this, which, which suggests that it's buying into just this uh, sort of accommodation of the scientific vernacular, uh, the non-vernacular uh, approach. But uh, many of the community, community leaders come back at these critiques and say, look, this is, this, this is, this is a way to, uh, for, for us to uh, establish and to, um, and to sort of imprint our, our, our uh, continuing claims. They recognize that there's a kind of invention of tradition uh, here, that the substantive things aren't the same, but nevertheless the vernacular discourse is important for them. Professor Daskala, did you have a Small comment, uh, uh, a historical footnote in a way. Uh, the distinction between uh, uh, supposedly wild forest and managed forest is a very ancient one. In fact, in Latin, the two words for forest is silva and foresta. Silva is the wild forest of northeastern Europe, uh, peopled by Adamist people, <coughs> like the German. Uh, it's, it's in, in Tacitus, Germany. You have the perfect description of how an Adamist uh, uh, <laughs> tribe uh, is interacts with the forest. And Floresta is the forest that has been appropriated and managed. Uh, and, uh, and in time of the of the uh, Carolingian uh, di dynasty, in particular, uh, in precisely in Germany, so there is a superposition here and a very ancient uh, mental schema uh, that uh, uh, contrasts uh, wild and domesticated. In fact, uh, and of course the the encounter between the the uh, European naturalist uh, forestry techniques and and um, in the whole in, in Southeast Asia, uh, uh, the traditional management of, of forest is in fact, I think, uh, it's not uh, entirely uh, linked to uh, colonialism, but it has a much uh, larger history. Another remark also, you, you, you were mentioning nature, culture, society, environment, etc. I think that uh, um, going beyond uh, uh, naturalism, um, in, implies going beyond anthropocentrism also. And of course the idea of environment is completely linked to, hum to humans. Uh, it's what surrounds us as humans. Um, I, I, this is why I like the, the French word milieu, which has been also uh, used, which is quite often used in English, or uh, Umwelt in German, because there is no notion of a centrality 
uh, there of a human centrality, a milieu or an umwelt is a coexistence of beings in a specific envi environment, place, whatever, no? And uh, I think linguistically, these very uh, linguistic uh, signs are very important in, in this process of reformulation and perhaps reformation also of our practices. And um, this is why I think I, I personally tend to eschew the word environment. <laughs> okay, can we uh, maybe take one, one more final question before coffee? If there's one out there. Okay, sure. I wanted to, I've, I've been doing a little scratching around, and, um, and there is a very interesting phenomenon about origin stories from some of these ancient civilizations. And almost all of them, in Peru, the, the Incas, the people came after many, many tries from the gods, and finally the gods made the people from corn. And they loved these people because they worshipped the gods. And so the people were separate and came distinctly and purposefully from the gods. And they were separate from everything else. Of course, we're familiar with the story from the monotheistic traditions as well, that the people are, are the product of the gods. In China, the people are the only reciprocal, the uh, a receptacle of the technological gift from the gods to come and do the agriculture and, 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 and cook the earth. So it's much, much older than Moore's ideas in his Capitel scene, which is really fascinating and his work is really nice. But, um, but it's not just, I, I think it's really, really a lot older and, and, and there's something about the cities and there's something about these ancient civilizations that's worth um, a little more excavation. We need our archaeological friends to come and play too. <laughs> Would you guys like to respond or? No? Okay, I think uh, maybe uh, if you could join me in thanking Jean Finkiao and uh, Jean Philippe for their uh, really stimulating talks. Thank you. Of the National Center for Scientific Research based in Marseille to give a talk entitled Current Conceptions and Practices of Nature in Vietnam. Welcome. Uh, first, thank you for IRASEC and Chiang Mai University for this invitation. And I think I am the only one researcher talking outside the area of uh, animism, and, uh, animism and Buddhism, because I will talk only about Vietnam. If it may be what I will talk, it will be different than you listened before. And about Vietnam, I will start by one, one funding. It's been in Vietnam, the many regulations about environment are new. The main of them start in 2005, and we have a large set of uh, environmental legislation, regulation about everything, about uh, national park, food security, pollution, everything. But on the field, we observed almost all the law are not respected. And uh, for example, every week in the news in Vietnam, uh, we have many scandals about the, the food infected by uh, antibiotic or dangerous chemical, everything like that. And in 2016, there was maybe the, the larger pollution in Southeast Asia. It means uh, one factory, one iron factory in the central Vietnam kill several thousand of fish on 2,500 kilometers and on 250 kilometers on the coast. And the government takes three months to accept the responsibility of the factory. Even just to show you what is the, the environmental issue in Vietnam today. And usually to try to understand the situation, we talk about the, the choice of the, the government. It means it's clear in Vietnam, the choice is uh, development, is not environment. We talk also a lot about the lack of information, lack of formation, the corruption of public servants, and many times also about the lack of strict control of pollution. And today I would like to talk about another reason, more cultural. This is the way of thinking and acting the relation between human and nature. Of course it's not easy than other reasons, but I will try to talk about this today. 
And my objective is to try to show for you the diversity and the, the, the way how to, con to concept the nature is open in Vietnam. And for that, I will uh, take some uh, historical data and also four examples to understand this. Alors first, in Vietnam, we have almost no text about the human and natural relationships, almost nothing. And I think, for example, when you walk about uh, China or Japan, there is much more literature. In Vietnam, no uh, tradition and no literature from, uh, from this topic. Is the reason why, to understand that, I need to build a puzzle. It's mean, I have only the small piece, I have many holes, and I try to understand what is the link between different pieces. And for that, I will use the, the history, because the Vietnam history is uh, very, um, very active, from the Chinese uh, rules and the uh, French colonization, and uh, the communist system, the new communist system was opened for the, the market economy. And the second tools I will use is the, the focus example. I have four examples, very, very open, to try to understand what this means nature in Vietnam. And of course, this is uh, only the, a work in progress. Alors, first things, we need to know the, the Vietnam was under Chinese rules for more than 1,000 years. It's been China, Vietnam was uh, uh, colonized by Chinese for 1,000 years. And this has a strong implication about the, the way of thinking the world, the, um, the literature also, because before China, before China come to Vietnam, there was no writing in Vietnam. And all the, the political elite in Vietnam and also the scholars, but also the population, borrow, assimilate, and adopt many things from China. The political system, many, many pieces from the cultural system also, and many, many elements from the religion, religion, Chinese religion. But for all these kind of things, what we see in Vietnam today is a mixed, is a syncretic things. It's been from the Vietnamese background, there was a synthesis, with a Chinese background. And it's very difficult to know what is come from what. Alors, to, to follow the idea of, uh, of Philippe Descola, I try to understand what is the cosmology. And what we, what we know is the, the, in the system of uh, Sino-Vietnamese uh, Sino cosmology, there is no conceptual separation between nature and human. What we say usually is they all belong to the great whole, and there was some orders and hierarchy to create, to build a link between them. Because the problem they have is everything is, is possible to connect, but everything is separate. If we don't have the same kind in the, in the for example, uh, naturalism, we have the one part, the human, one part, the nature. It's clear, they have a clear domain. In the Chinese system, there is no that. Everybody together. And to think that, we need to create some link. What the short, the short sentence we use usually is to say this word, see this is a word with, where everything is constantly connected with everything. You can imagine the difficulty to think about that. And for example, the conception of the imperial political power is directly connecting with the cosmology. For example, you see the, the character about the king, Wang, in Chinese. The three horizontal terms, the first one is the sky, the medium is a human being, and uh, the last one is the earth. And the line, the vertical line, is the power of the king. The king makes the harmony between the sky, human, and earth. Even in the writing, we have the, the ideology of the, the political system is directly connecting with the, the way they think the, the world and nature. And usually we, we, uh, we stamp this kind of uh, system, some kind of uh, Analogism uh, ontology. Now, the second step in the Vietnamese history is the French colonization. Now, for my, uh, my presentation, I focus on the, the, main, the main important things uh, is the introduction of the Western naturalism ontology in Vietnam by, by French colonialists. And we, call, we can describe this one as a conceptual separation between nature and human. And the, the um, 
the, the main impact was about the, to introduce the modern science and industrial approach, and also at the political point of view, it was the individualistic, democratic, and human rights ideology. And this is the point what the, the Vietnamese elite take first. It means they focus a lot about the political point of view. And when we're looking for deep information about this period, we see almost nothing was borrowed in the French idea of nature for Vietnamese, except maybe the idea of the modern medicine. It's the reason today we have two systems in Vietnam, the Western medicine and the traditional one. And also, one point important, the, this first introduction of the, the Western naturalism ontology in Vietnam was the, the first step, the base, for the Marxism ideology. Alors, the communist period, donc start in the 1945, and I make them the first period finish in the 1986, because it was a, the important economical reform we call Doi Moi. And this, is the, this short period was the period of the very strong communist system. And it's important to know the Marxist-Leninism is import ideology, is import from Russia, China, and France too. And there was the same kind of the, the, the Chinese conception of the world was import in Vietnam. This one was import in Vietnam and adapt to Vietnam, the same kind. And uh, we, can, uh, we can stem the same, we can step this, this ideology as, a, as an extreme case of application of uh, Western naturalism theory. Why? Because the, the base of this ideology is the social evolutionism. It's been in the, in the mind of this project, this uh, society project, there is a clear hierarchy between society. Society starts from feudal to become capitalist, and to become at the end communist. And as I will tell after, is a, some kind of messianic project. But all the, all the impact of the, the communist system on the everyday life is a collectivization of the means of production. It was an action against capitalism. And also a very strong modernization and industrialization of the country with the price of the destruction of the many natural resources because they were thinking just as a tool to achieve the goals, the goals of the national revolution and national development. And also the political, political uh, point of view, there was a very strong social, cultural and political control on the society. And the project was to build a new socialist man to reach the perfect society, as I talk, is a messianic project. And in the 1986, uh, there was a big change. Following the, the reform in China, Vietnam adopted the, the new, new slogan, the socialist-oriented market economy. It's, of course, it's an oxymoron because how we can put together socialism and market economy, but is the base of the system in Vietnam today. And the same before, we can think the market economy is a part of the Western naturalism theory. It's been one more time, they import something, and they introduce in the Vietnamese system. Of course, they need to adapt the ideology because the social evolu evolutionism must be adapted or transformed to don't be opposite to socialism. And the important fact is the almost full privatization of the means of production, but the private enterprise has strong connecting with the party state. It means because of that, they have the freedom to don't respect the law and we'll see the impact of the no respect of the law on the environmental issue. And the same before, I think they have a using of the natural resources with a great technical tools, it's been faster destruction, and with the same objective, the productivity and natural development, and also to keep quiet the, the public uh, contestation, because the economical economy is a tool in Vietnam as a political tool. And also we have, a, before, in the first communist period, it was a strong control. Like the, just, it was very strong, like it's only strong control. But they still control all the civil society and the media, especially internet. Ah, attends, j'ai une transition à faire. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Alors, after the history, I will talk about uh, four, four examples. 
And this, for example, will help us to understand what is mean nature or natural in the, in the Sino-Vietnamese world. And uh, I will use one example in Japan, because in Japan they, they have the, the capacity to express this special conception of the world in the international institution. We will see that this case is uh, UNESCO. I will start a long, long time ago. I will start by the a quotation of uh, Chuang Tzu, a Chinese philosopher. Alors, just to make short about that, I think oh, I'll read everything better, better for you, maybe. Alors, when the man reaches a very high level of mastery in the heart, alors the heart can be can be religious heart in the ritual, can be intellectual in the study of a classic text, can be technical or aesthetic by exercise or by handicraft. And um, the act, donc, uh, when the, the men uh, reach a very high level of mastery heart, they can act without mobilizing their minds. The action is then done in a natural way without effort and reach it perfection. This action is then in conformity with the sky, which is natural and spontaneous. The action of man on the world is then in harmony with sky and earth. Man can then reach nature. We just talked about this before with the conception of the, the perfect uh, power of the empire in China. It's been the perfect action is to make the harmony between the sky, the man, and earth. And what is important for us is the idea of nature in this case is not a state, is not a being, is something the man built by himself, by his effort, by his time. And in this text also they talk about how the, the, the competent master can support the student to reach this level. Now, the second example is more, is more politic. Uh, donc, the title is Sacrifice the Forest to Save the Political System. 1979 is the black year for Vietnam. Donc, the war against Khmer Rouge, the big war in the border against China, and the major famine in the north, because more than 20 years of collectivization of the land and the state cooperative. It was the, the country was in the close to revolution. And what's happened? The, the six the, yeah, the six plenary of central com community of the Vietnamese community, Communist Party vote resolution number six. And the main content of this revolution is to give authorization for the farmer to cut the forest to produce what they want without any restriction. It's been, it was an official and legal encouragement for deforestation. The evaluation, what we can do, is after 10 years of this regulation, almost 1 million hectares of forest was disappeared in Vietnam. And from my different interview from the, the Vietnamese the public servant and the farmer, everybody considered it was a good time. Because when we have a crisis, we can use the forest to get some money. And interesting, in the 1993, there is a big reform about the land in Vietnam, and there is the first and the stronger law to uh, forbidden the cultivation of opium. And in the mountain of northern Vietnam, many ethnic groups, for, for them it was the main income. But the difference than Thailand, in Vietnam, when they forbidden the opium, there was almost no uh, substitution, no product of substitution. It's been many ethnic groups don't have any income for a few years. And what they do, they go to the forest and they cut the forest and they sell the wood. It's been we have two times in the Vietnamese history, the public, the public, uh, public policy support the destruction of the forest. Alors, the, the example number three is interesting because we, we come exactly inside the logical of the system of the analogism. Vietnam and uh, China, and China and Vietnam are two countries with a high demand of the white meat, especially from the protected spaces. And I just talk about one example. In 2010, the last rhinoceros of Java was killed in national park in the South Vietnam for his horn. It's around 20,000 euros for one. And I don't talk here about the 
the foot or the, the liver of the tiger, of beer, everything, because we can find this in almost all the specialized restaurants in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. And of course, because the price is very, very expensive. And when you see that in other side, for example, when the uh, mountain ethnic group, they catch one tiger, they get more money than if they have 20 years of production of rice. It's been, of course, it's forbidden, but it's so much money. And you know, if the police catch you, you give them half money you have, and there is no problem. It's the reason why there was almost no tiger in Vietnam. But for us, more interesting, why this kind of people, Chinese Vietnamese, they like to eat this kind of animals. Because they think, when eating the part of animals, you can introduce in you some quality, especially the power or the strongness, especially the sexual force. And this example is just to show you where one case where human and non-human share the same domain. It means they can connect together by food. Our last example is in, in Japan. Uh, maybe some of you know this concept, the concept of uh, Satoyama. I think in the book of uh, Philippe uh, de Scola, there is some small part about that. It's very important because it's, a, it's the first time we have uh, officially the international uh, promoting of the analogism ontology. And just to make brief, the, donc Sato is means village and the, the cultural land, Yama is means mountain, and, but also the forest cultivating in the, in the mountain. It means the Sato Yama is including all the environmental mosaic of forest, grassland, farm, lake, garden. And it's interesting because it's a specific form of biodiversity built and maintained by humans. We have the articulation between, in the, the Philippe uh, talk before, but what is environment? Is a product or is a constitutive? And here we show that it's both. It means that environment is a, you are inside, but we build this in the same time. And more interesting for us, in 2010 at UNESCO, Japan tried to introduce this concept for international regulation in biodiversity. But it was not working very well. They have just small initiatives in different places, but the UNESCO don't accept this kind of uh, things. It's too different than the, the, um, the Western natural ontology. It's too far from the, the, the dominant ideology actually at UNU. Uh, and it's interesting because this conception of the world show one time where nature and human are, are not separate. And uh, to go deeper in this way, uh, there was one French geographer, he's called Augustin Berck, and he was working uh, especially in Japan. And he developed a lot of things about the concept of milieu. We don't have the translation in English, milieu. And for the short definition, it's been the the man-made milieu or environment, that build the man. It means we have the, the recipro reciprocal action. And it's very important because this conception is a key point to show, to, to, in fact, to overcome to the, the dualism of the Western thinking about nature and human being, but larger than this. Even all the system of uh, formal, logical formal with the A, B, and we cannot make not A and A together. It's impossible. But Augustin Berg said, in Japan, we can do that. I say the limit of the, of the Western system is this option and this restriction. Just it was the, the, um, the shame of the, the Satoyama initiative. And if you see the, the five, five circles in blue, I think they are almost similar than the, the, the sustainable development. Until that, is, a, is a, we think something standard. But when we come up, uh, I think they think about, the, for example, traditional ecological knowledge. That is not in the sustainable development project. And at the end, the vision is realizing society in harmony with nature. We find again this idea of a tree level and the line, the vertical line to connect the tree level. Alors, in the four examples I just presented for you, what is interesting is uh, I try to understand 
what nature means and what we can talk about nature. It's been, in the first example, nature is a, or natural is product by human learning and human action. In the second case, the nature is using as a reserve for economical resources or for money. The example number three, this is the, the entity they can share the quality with human. The example number four is one area where natural biodiversity is built and maintained by men. We have also this, this interaction between. And one of the common features uh, for this three exa for example, is that nature is not self-definite or immutable state. It's not a being like as we have in the Western naturalism ontology, but it's a product of action or is a product of relationships. And this remark about the difference between action and being is a cross the definition of Alter given by the scholar in 2005. And this opposition between state of being and action of being, we find this in the book of uh, Philippe Descola. And for him, he said, for naturalism ontology, being are those whose interiority is different. It's been I had who do not think like us, like human beings, the same kind of animals, or, or and or those who has no interiority. It's been the, the natural object. But in this status, they are, they are relative to being, and they are fixed. They not depend to the action. And it's impossible to go from alter to ego, or to ego to alter. There is a strict separation between. On the analogy ontology, alter is tools who do not share the same unifying point of view. And alter is defined by his position, by his action on the other, but not, not, with no relation with his being. Analogism offers the possibility of changing by action and the alter become ego or ego become alter. As we see in the, the example before, when people integrate the piece of nature to keep some, some power from the nature, or the idea of uh, natural biodiversity built, built by men in Japan. And my, my uh, last question is about the structure, because it's an uh, important uh, important ID in the book of uh, Philippe Descola. What we see in the 130 years in Vietnam, we have four major reversals of, of uh, ontology. The first is a donc ontology, uh, analogy, analogy ontology from China, but it was already a syncretic thing because the Vietnamese take from China and they transform that. After that, they add the classical French naturalism. We which served uh, as a base from the Marxism ideology. And finally, they integrate the ideology of liberal economy. This comes to add in this already complex set. Alors, what is important for us is to understand the ontology is not given here for all the time. They can change. And especially in this time, we can see the, the conjuncture or the history, like Western colonization on Marxism ideology, in few decades, they can transform the deep structure of thinking and action. And this is uh, connecting with the idea of Marshall Salins, developed in this book in the Island of History. And he shows us the return of Captain Cook in the Highland. Everybody know the history? Oh, Captain Cook come to the Highland, in the Hawaii Island. He have a very good welcome. People help him for everything. When is uh, is bought, they go back. They want to come back to uh, to England, but they have a big storm. They need to come back to Hawaii. They come back to Hawaii, and the Hawaiian people kill him on the beach. We don't understand why. The first welcome, second one they kill him, because they think uh, Captain Cook was a deity from them, and he comes just the first time when in the ritual the deity come to visit the country. But in the ritual and the mythical story, he can never come back in the same time. He can come back one year after in the circle. Because he come back, he break all the political, religious, and social system in the Hawaii society in a few years. Why? Because the, the society was controlled by the priests, people from the religion. And the people, the secular people, use this against the priests. They say, what you tell about the, the God is not, not true. 
because the god come back. In the reality, he cannot come back. He's not the god. All the system break down like that. Just to show how one structure very strong can be broken with one, one time in the conjuncture, arrive in the exactly the good time where it not need to come back. Just for conclusion, uh, all these specific cases show the conjuncture, the history, the human action can upset structure even if we think they are very stable and even immutable. And maybe this is how the new structures are born. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>